Vision season, Genesis Church, padow. That was the official kickoff right there. That's the noise too, padow. It's the vision noise. You didn't know that, but now you do. Do I got any like five-year plan people in the room? Where are my five-year plan people? One, two, three, four. Just a couple psychos? Okay, one more right there. That's great. Uh, I, five-year plan stressed me out, man. So here's, here's what vision is not. Vision is not a five-year plan. Vision is not what's... Vision, a big component of vision is being able to see opportunities where other people see obstacles. And vision just brings clarity out of all of the options that we have. There's so many options that we have as a church, so many things that we could be pursuing, so many things we could be investing in. And so I just wanna bring clarity because there's lots of options right now of what we could do as a church, who we could be. And God has been speaking very specific things to the leadership of this church. And so, so part of what we do in this season is help you understand the mold into which you are growing. I, I hope that... that what you see in this is something you can go, yeah, that's something I wanna be a part of. Many of you have already been a part of this church for a very long time. Many of you are brand new. And so really what we're doing in this series is kind of giving language to what God has been breathing, I believe sovereignly through our church for the last 12 or 18 months. And so vision has the ability to bring clarity when you have, you know, 70, so you guys, I mean, business owners and you have like different options that you could, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this. Vision brings clarity to the one or two things. And poof, that's, and so out of all the options we have, I want to bring clarity to you. And so for this next season of our church, God is calling us to do two very specific things. Number one, to teach. And number two, to reach. To teach and to reach. And you'd be like, well, isn't that like kind of the mission of the church anyway? Well, I'm glad you noticed. Because sometimes we get so caught up in all of our flashy vision statements that the best, we forget the best way forward is to walk the ancient paths and to recover the ancient paths that some of them have, have overgrown. And we gotta, you know, my kids are super into Jumanji right now. They just wanna watch Jumanji all the time. And then they're just like, you know, they, they wish that our house would grow into like a jungle. I'm like, that's my actual nightmare, that the outside would come inside. I stay inside so I don't have to go to the outside. I don't need the, the outside coming to the inside. But we're just, we're, we're clearing the ancient paths. But we are, to, we are to teach and we are to reach. And we're swimming in a world full of postmodern ideas and applied postmodernism that's become applicable. And there's all these kinds of things that are, that, that are setting themselves up as this is the way, this is the way, this is the way, this is the way. And so I wanna bring clarity because we are to teach and to reach. We're gonna have sound doctrine and we're gonna reach people in Jesus' name. God has really been clarifying and solidifying things in us through our, I mean, we got GLC students in the room. It's week three of GLC, about to kick off. Man, it's been so fun already. We got 14 weeks left and I'm pumped. Yeah, wits in my cohort. But the Holy Spirit's been ministering to me from Revelation chapter two. I was gonna use this as the last of our uh, vision series on November 21st where we bring our vision offering, um, a free will offering in response to how God has blessed us this year. And so vision offering builds the church. Our tithe and offering run the church, but vision offering builds the church, expands the church. And so in three weeks, many of you have already been praying for months about what it is that you would bring, preparing your heart. So November 21st, we're bringing our free will offering in response to how God has blessed us this year. Thinking through what God has been doing and breathing and speaking into us. I was going to preach this that day, but I just had to start here for this series. In Revelation chapter two, scripture says to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. This is Jesus talking to, he starts a series of speaking to seven churches. And this is the very first one he speaks to. And he's speaking through the apostle John, who's at the end of his life. He's an old man when he's writing the book of Revelation. He's an old man when he writes the gospel of John, first, second, and third John and Revelation. I always like to bring this up when I'm talking about John because he had such a unique life that all the other apostles are dead and gone by this point. Those who walked with Jesus, John's the only one left. And they tried to kill him because he wouldn't stop preaching. They're like, you gotta stop preaching. He's like, no, how about no? So they try and kill him. 
History records at one point they even tried to boil him in oil, like to kill him, and he just like would not die. So they're like, fine, if you won't stop preaching, we're going to put you on an island by yourself where there's no people. And he goes, cool. Anybody got a pen? And he just starts writing. And he writes the Gospel of John. And he writes 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And then he gets this, this, the revelation of the Apostle John. And so he starts it out, the letter starts out writing to seven churches that existed and were distinct and had distinct mantles and distinct callings, distinct lampstands, if you will, distinct influence, distinct anointing on them. So he says, he starts out, the very first church he speaks to is the Ephesian church. And this is what Jesus says to the Ephesian church. Imagine, imagine that you get a letter to your church from your Lord and Savior. Like, what's it gonna say? It's got like hearts over the eyes and stuff. He like unroll, it's like check yes or no. But Revelation 2, 2, here's what Jesus says to the Ephesian church. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. Imagine Jesus writing that to your church. I know your works. I know your toil. I know your patient endurance. I know how you cannot bear with those who are evil. But you have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. Imagine, imagine that's how the letter to your church starts out. I know your works. I know your toil. I know your patient endurance. I know how you cannot bear with evil, but you, and, and how you have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you have found them to be false. He continues in verse three. I know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up, getting sturdy, thick a good. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up. Why? For my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Okay, we are starting out hot, people. What a letter to get. So here's what's going on in Ephesus at the time. Ephesus is, by most accounts, like the fourth largest city in the world at this point. Some 250,000 people call Ephesus home. It's a, it's a major cultural center. It's a major center of religious worship. It's in modern day Turkey. And so anybody coming from the spice trades in the east or the subcontinent of India, as they are coming into the Roman Empire, most of the roads move through the city of Ephesus. It's like the gateway to all, all the finer things and luxuries of the Roman Empire. There's a sports arena there. There's a, a world-renowned theater where there's these crazy musical productions. The Temple of Artemis or Diana, if you're Greek, the Temple of Artemis is there. It's one of the, the Temple of Artemis, by the way, is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Like the pyramids of Giza, the hanging gardens of Babylon, all these incredible, these massive architectural feats. The temple of Artemis is there in Ephesus. Artemis, she was a, uh, she was like a, a, the fertility goddess. One of her, she was a hunts, a huntswoman. She's from the woods. That's what they call it, a huntswoman. That's a cool title. I'm a huntswoman. One of, one of the symbols of her was a tree, a tree that represented fertility. So women, when they were trying to conceive, they would pray to Artemis. They would sacrifice to Artemis for fertility. When they would go into childbirth, they would pray. They had these little idols to Artemis that they would pray to for a safe birth and for the provision and the fruitfulness of the family. So this is Ephesus. And the church there, when, when Paul gets to Ephesus in Acts chapter 19, he finds a small group of believers there probably mid 50s, late 50s AD, Acts chapter 19, he finds a small group of believers there. And he kind of has a run in with the silversmiths. If you're, I'm, I'm just gonna summarize it 
but you can read it in Acts chapter 19 for yourself. The silversmiths, their main business was forming these little, these little idols to worship Artemis with. And so Paul, he gets to, he gets to Ephesus and he walks in and he's like, hey, are, do, you guys, are you, do you guys know about the Holy Spirit? They're like, no, who's the Holy Spirit? He's like, seriously? Okay, he's like, I got, which baptism do you have? They're like, we have the baptism of John. And he goes, oh my gosh, that's the baptism of repentance, but I'm about to baptize you in fire. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is baptism with fire. And they go, yeah, give us that one. And they're baptized in the Holy Spirit. This just church starts growing such that it becomes a problem for these silversmiths in Ephesus because people are no longer buying these idols from them because they're like, well, we worship the one true God and we're not worshiping Artemis anymore. And they're like, bro, this guy, Paul's gonna put us out of business. So they go to all the other trade guilds and they're like, guys, Paul's a problem. Christianity is a problem. They're like, yeah. And they like stir up a mob in Ephesus. Major cultural, major religious center, Artemis, the tree is one of her symbols, fertility goddess. This is, this is the place that Paul comes into. Now, John writing this is probably 30 years later. Can you imagine all of the ideas that were swimming around in Ephesus? All of the cultural ideas that were contrary to the truth, the logos truth of scripture that my truth becomes a testimony when I submit it to the truth of the word of God. And so, yeah, you got a truth, you got things that have happened to you and, and you have a story to tell, but it only becomes powerful testimony when it's submitted to the truth, the logos truth of the word of God. That's what makes your truth powerful is when it's submitted to the truth and then God can use it in massive ways. But there's all these ideas swimming around. It's not much different than now. A lot of postmodernism that's, that's floating around that sounds really nice and sounds pretty close to scripture. But what he says about the Ephesian church in verse two is he says, I love how you have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not. He says, one of the things that I love about you Ephesian church is how you were bathed. The culture was all around you, let, yet you did not let the ideas of the culture permeate your doctrine and permeate the walls of your church. He's like, I love that about you. And he's like, and I know how you had to endure. I know what it cost you. You're bearing up for my namesake and you have not grown weary. And I believe that what God is breathing through the people in this church is a desire for sound doctrine that stands against the counterfeits of culture. And to teach, to have a place where the counterfeit ideas of culture, nice as they may sound, do not permeate the doctrine. Verse four, he says, but this I have against you. Oh, man. You know, it's like when somebody is like, oh my gosh, you're so pretty and you're so fun, you're so funny. And you're the, my most favorite person at parties and your car is really fast and, uh, but, and you're like, okay, none of that mattered. You're just trying to get to the but and then everything after that is what really matters. He's like, I love how you've kept sound doctrine. I love how you didn't let the culture permeate your church. And he goes, but I have this against you. You've abandoned the love that you had at first. I've heard this preach many times about like you've abandoned your first love and it's, it's usually about like recapturing your relationship with Jesus and it feels like you're dating him, like the butterflies you got when you first started dating and like this Nicholas Sparks thing where you go like buy the house and you furnish it and she didn't even know. And I wrote you every day, but she didn't know it because she didn't get the letters. I'm trying to recapture this moment. Why didn't you write me? I wrote you every day. <laughs> They're trying to recapture it. But he doesn't say you've lost your first love. He says you've lost the love that you had at first. Some 30 years later, what we know is that the Christian church has grown in influence and emphasis such that the silversmiths and some of the other idol makers are nearly out of business. The church has grown in influence, but his caution is that 
somewhere along the way, somewhere along the way, you started to love your doctrine more than you love the people that I died for. And let's not make a dumb dichotomy here. I'm not pitting doctrine and loving people against one another. We need both. We need sound doctrine so we can love people well so that we can love them truly and properly. This cultural moment, their, their definition of love is don't kill my vibe. And anything that kills my vibe is not loving. Whereas Thomas Aquinas defined Christian love as willing the highest good of another. So for me to truly love someone, I need sound doctrine. Otherwise I fall prey to the, to the to, I get tossed to and fro by nice sounding ideas and other winds of doctrine. So I don't wanna make it sound like I'm saying, we need to love people more than we love our doctrine. We need both. Because it's only sound doctrine that allows me to love people the way that's gonna help them flourish in the way that God created them to be. But, but he says, I have this against you that you've abandoned the love that you had at first. And doesn't this happen? Because they started out as this small fringe minority group in Ephesus that was totally dependent on God for their provision, their protection, their righteousness, because they had nobody else to depend on. They couldn't depend on influence. They couldn't depend on having a seat at the political table. They couldn't depend on being recognized as legitimate. All, all they had to depend on was the power of the Holy Spirit and God at work in their church. And then this is what happened. Somehow along the way as they grew in influence, they forgot why they started in the first place. And so he's like, I commend you that you, your doctrine is dialed, bro. You have not allowed the ideas of the culture to permeate the walls of your church. But you forgot why. And when I believe God has been breathing through this church as a desire and you are here in no small part because there's something here that God is doing that's resonating with your spirit. And I believe about you, there's, there's a desire to grow deeper in sound doctrine. And let me give a caution to those of us in the room that tend to be a little bit heady. Is that it's really, really, really easy for us to focus so much on having our doctrine dialed that we forget the reason why we need to have it dialed. Because there are people who don't know Jesus. And so we're not just gonna teach, we're gonna reach. He says, you've abandoned the love that you had at first. I don't, I don't want this letter to be written to our church. You did a fantastic job of, of not letting postmodernism and all the things that come with it permeate the walls of your church. But you forgot why you started in the first place. In verse five, he says, remember therefore from where you have fallen. Wait, what? Weren't you just like, you guys are so good, you're so good. What do you mean we've fallen? Apparently to fall in the kingdom of God means to forget why you have dialed doctrine for them as a church. What started out is them needing, they're so aware of their need for Jesus. It's like you forgot, you forgot. Yeah, your, your doctrine is dialed, Ephesus. My goodness, the, the way you've had to endure and fight to keep things tight in a culture swimming with other ideas, I commend you, but you forgot why. So remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. Why, why do I want my doctrine dialed? Because I have friends who don't know Jesus. And I got family members who don't call on Jesus as Lord and Savior. And that is the primary lens through which we view the world. Alive in Christ or dead in sin not in an elitist sense, lest we forget that we were dead in sin and Jesus saved us. But the reason we have to get this right doctrinally is because there are people dead in sin. He says, repent and do the works you did at first. And if not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand. I'll remove the influence that you have. I'll remove 
this grace that I've graced your church with, I will, I will remove it unless you repent. So this is gonna be a place where we fight for clear doctrine and we boldly speak the truth of the word, but we remember that there are people on the other side of every one of those policies. This was something that was so beautiful about who Jesus was, is that he never compromised the truth. But there was something so compelling about his life that people who didn't agree with him wanted to be around him. Let that be said of me, let that be said of you. Let it not just be said of us, this is where Jesus says in Mark 8, 35, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Herodians. Let it not just be said of we, our doctrine is dialed, but nobody's coming to Jesus at your church. Or let it be said that, look at all these people who are coming to Jesus, but your doctrine is a mess. Let it, let it be right here, this transcendent third way of the kingdom, where we have clear doctrine, sound doctrine, but there's something so compelling about the glory of God and the spirit of God at work through you in your life that at the very least, people are curious. I, I gotta know some more. And he's like, if you don't repent of this, if you don't realize the heights from which you have fallen, because the reason you started this out and the reason you wanted to fight to keep the culture out is because you saw how it was hurting people and you saw how its ideas were hurting people and further dividing them and making them more fearful and making them suspicious of one another. And so you didn't let it into the walls of your church, but somewhere over this last three decades, you forgot that it wasn't just for you, it was for them too. And then verse six, he says something rather curious. He goes, yet this you have. So he's like, I commend you, I commend you, I rebuke you, I commend you. It's a good leadership strategy. It's called the sandwich. <laughs> Man, you're so awesome. You suck at this, but God, you're so awesome. Verse six, he says, yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Does this fly in the face of the Jesus you've curated? He, there's, there's things that he hates. So I love that he tempers this because he says, you forgot the love that you had. And he goes, but I also commend you for hating the works of the Nicolaitans because I hate their works too. Notice what he did not say. You hate the Nicolaitans because I hate them too. Jesus died for the Nicolaitans. He says, you hate the works. What that is that there are some works, there are some ideas, there are some movements, there are some things that are saying they can bring about human flourishing, but they cannot. And the works, the fruit of their works is destructive. And it's good for us to hate the works, the fruit, the outworking. So this is not just to say you forgot to love, it's a blanket statement for do you, boo. It's, hey, remember why you have sound doctrine. It's for you to guard your own heart and mind, but it's also for them. And so don't forget the love that you had, that you will, the reason you want your doctrine died is because you will their highest good. But there are some things out there, some works that cannot deliver on what they promise and they're hurting people, and you hate those works, and I commend you because I hate them too. And then verse seven, he says something that Jesus often says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. You know what that means? Use some discernment with that last sentence that I just spoke. This teaching and reaching is gonna require discernment in your life to hold fast to the faith, to contend for the faith, to hold fast to what is true. And also to have your heart bleed for those who don't know Jesus, it's gonna require discernment in relationship, discernment in conversation, discernment in strategy. But this is the vision that we're called to, to teach and to reach. And he says, to the one who conquers, I will grant, to, conquers what? conquers this slow drift that we have to fall in love at times with our doctrine so much that we forget about people. And hear me again, I cannot say it enough times. I am not pitting the two against one another. 
They do not compete with one another. They're complementary. We need sound doctrine so we can love people properly. And he says, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And I love how to each one of the churches, he has this little, this little Easter egg. There's something so symbolic and so exact to the mantle and the call that's on that church. And he says, to the one who conquers that, I will grant to eat of the tree of life. One of the symbols of Artemis was the tree and she was the fertility goddess fruitfulness of the womb. And he says, if you can get this right, I will grant you to eat of the real version of the counterfeit that you've been resisting. I will grant that to you, Ephesus. If you can conquer this, you will taste the reality of that which you have been resisting the counterfeit. So you say you want unity and you say you want justice and you say you want freedom and you say you want revival. And if you can resist the counterfeits that are trying to permeate, I will grant it to you to eat of it supernaturally. And that lampstand will be established to the church at Ephesus. So we're gonna be careful that we don't misappropriate prophecies to, to one place and make it our own. I recognize that, but I feel this as a word from the Holy Spirit for us, that if we can get this right, that God will grant us to eat of the reality of the counterfeit that we've been resisting. That, this would be, this, that it would be a paradoxical place or people would be like, gosh, how is it that dialed? Yet people who don't know Jesus and in fact would probably disagree with the doctrine, they still want to be around. Oh, I know that's because it is the power of the word of God and the spirit of God at work. So I don't just want to be a place and I don't want to be part of a church. And what I believe about you is you don't want to be part of a church that's just like everything is awesome, but it's kind of scripturally a mess. And then what I believe about you, you don't wanna be a part of a church that seems to be so dialed in its doctrine that there's like 200 people all turned inward saying, aren't we so smart and being totally ineffective? But that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we could thread the needle, being sound, contending for the faith, contending for truth, being a place that is compelling and your life would be compelling for those who don't know Jesus. That's my prayer. That's the vision. That, that's the direction that we have set. And all of our resources, our strategies are gonna be heading that direction to equip you because that's what I believe about you too. I'm so thankful for so many of the, the young people in our church. I say the young people because I'm 36 and my pastor told me the other day, you realize you're not the young guy anymore. And I was like, okay, thanks. But so, so many of the cultural conversations for a lot of us are kind of like uh, intellectual exercises. But I just, there's many young people who are part of our church who it's not an intellectual exercise for you, it's your real life. You're like, I wanna hold fast to the truth of scripture. I don't wanna hold fast to the reality of who God said he is, but, I've, I've, but I desperately wanna love my transgender roommate. And it's, it's not an intellectual exercise. It's like, this is my life and I wanna do it right because I wanna show them Jesus. But I don't wanna compromise truth to do it. So how do, I, how do I walk this road? How do I walk this out? How do I walk out my faith in a 21st century context? Because the scripture applies in the 21st century. It's not some old dusty doctrinal book. It is the bread of life for those who would eat it. And so that's our aim. How do, how do we pastor? How do we love? How do we hold fast to truth? And how do we pastor people well? How do we have grace in our mouth and truth at the same time? Full of grace, full of truth, Jesus was. He was 100% both. He wasn't grace sometimes and truth other times. He was full of grace and truth at all times. That is, that is growing up to the fullness of him who is Christ, the head of his church. Growing up into maturity. And so I pray that as we embark in this next season to, to equip you to run your race well, 
to be bastions of light, to be, to, to be salt and light in this world. That you wouldn't be so overwhelmed by it that you would just pull yourself out and just relegate your faith to inside the four walls on a Sunday because it was too hard to live out during the week. We're gonna be bold and we're gonna be brave and it's gonna get messy and we're gonna stub our toe, but we're gonna have clear eyes looking straight to heaven, looking to Jesus who is the author and finisher of our faith. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we will continue to be sanctified into who he has called this church to be. We're gonna teach and we're gonna reach. And we're gonna love well and we're gonna wrestle. And we're gonna argue. You can, you can argue, it's okay. You're arguing, wrestling, getting to truth. We're gonna disagree and then we're gonna come to the table together because our relationship is far more important than the disagreement. And I pray that in this next season, this is saying it's, we're just giving language to what I believe God has been doing in the last 12 to 18 months through this house. That I pray that you're equipped to live out the fullness of God's call in your world. In Jesus name, amen. Can we stand together? I wanna pray for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we love you so much. We love your word. We love your word. Place a desire in us to know your word, to know it well. God, I pray there's people right now who this is their actual life. It's not intellectual exercise. This is their actual life. Holy Spirit, be with them in Jesus' name. Empower them, embolden them. Give them the words to say, the discernment to know when to speak up and when to shut up, when to challenge, when to embrace. that we would be living examples of what it looked like to be in the world, but not of it. God, we wanna get this right. We wanna get it right. Holy Spirit, help us in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Mm. Maybe you're here today and you would say, Pastor, I wouldn't consider myself a Christian. I wouldn't consider myself somebody who Jesus is the Lord of my life. We're gonna pray. We'd like to end every gathering in this way. We're gonna pray. Call it a salvation prayer, call it a prayer of new beginnings, call it a fresh start. But maybe you've never prayed this before. Maybe, maybe today would represent what we say, um, praying it for the first time again. Maybe today represents a rededication. You, you're saying, Father, I'm all in. You are Lord. You're not just buddy. You're not just friends with benefits where I want you to be in my world when I need you, but then when you need something from me, I ghost you. Like, I really, I really want you to be Lord. So we're gonna pray. And I'm gonna ask each of us in this room and joining us online, if, most of us have probably prayed something like this before. And so I'm gonna ask us to pray out loud together. We're gonna join our faith with the faith of those who are praying out loud for the first time or the first time again. And if today represents you saying yes to Jesus or or maybe saying yes again, I would just love for you to incline your heart to the Father. I know there's people in this room, there might be people, you might be in a busy place, you might be on a layover in an airport or something and you're watching this and there's stuff all around, but just, just take a moment with you and the Lord. Just incline your heart toward him and we're gonna pray along with you in this moment. So can we join our faith with theirs, church? Can we pray together? Say, Father, thank you. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. I know that I've sinned and I need you. So would you come into my world? Be my leader, be my Lord. You are king. Give me a fresh start. Make me brand new. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and use my life to build your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen. Come on, Jesus.